Hello, and welcome to the 100th episode of the Cook Memorial Public Library podcast. I'm your host, Nate Goss. And yes, you did hear me right. This is episode 100 of the podcast. Uh, Hard to believe we've made it this far, but thank you so much for following us along the way. And thank you so much for listening today. We've got a special fitting 100th episode because today we have our local history librarian, Jenny Berry, back on the podcast for another local history episode, this time dedicated to the library's centennial celebration. Throughout the year, the library has been celebrating its centennial in many different ways, one of which has been some amazing blog posts on our Shelf Life blog, going through the library's history decade by decade. We will link to these blog posts in the show notes, and you're definitely going to want to check these out. But for this episode, uh, Jenny is going to be going through and giving us just a few highlights from the library's history up until 1960. Stay tuned for future episodes where we will dig a little bit deeper into the library's history up until today. But let's jump over to my conversation with Jenny Berry presenting Centennial Stories, The First 40 Years. All right, Jenny Berry, welcome back to the Cook Memorial Public Library podcast. Always great to see you. Thanks, Nate. Glad to be back. You know, for this episode, we're talking about the centennial, which, you know, we've been doing a lot of stuff around the library for the centennial, um, kind of all year round. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about um, what we have been doing and also what's going to be coming up pretty soon? Sure. So we started planning about a year ago, um, knowing that 1921 was going to be our 100th year. Uh, And we had things throughout the year. So we started out in April back when it was National Library Week. And we did a presentation about the library, which we're going to we've expanded and are going to represent next week. Uh, And then we had some programs in the Children's Department that related to Libreville in the 1920s and some American Girl dolls. Uh, some crafts at that point. We've been writing blog posts of the history of the library decade by decade, along with my colleague Sonia Schoenfield. Uh, We're up through the first part of the 1960s now, and we're going to have to keep working on it next year uh, as we go decade by decade. Just recently in October, we had an open house both at Cook Park and at Aspen celebrating the birthday. And at the Cook Park, we people were actually able to tour the Cook Home, which was the original library that opened in 1921. Um, coming up, we're wrapping up the end of the year. Um, we still do have the opportunity for people to record their personal memories of the library, whether they remember it being in the Cook Home or uh, at Aspen or Evergreen. Um, on our Centennial page, there's a link to how to record. If people aren't comfortable recording a video, they can always send us a letter, send us an email. We're happy to receive the information that way as well. And then anything else Centennial that's coming up would be listed on our Centennial page. Uh, but we are kind of winding down the year. It's been a quite a full year. A full year of celebrating. Yeah, yes. and it's, it's a huge milestone. I was actually at the um, the Cook Park celebration and people just loved looking at the the different things around the timeline, the quilt that we had out and, uh, you know, a lot of people taking advantage of that Cook House tour. And, and, and that Centennial page is on our website. So listeners, definitely go check that out and see all the different ways that you can get involved. But for this podcast episode, we're going to go a little bit deeper into some history. And these are all based on the blog posts that you and your colleague Sonia have written decade by decade, um, right. which, of course, we will link in our show notes so people can take a look at those. But let's talk a little bit about the early, early, early days of, of Cook Memorial Public Library. Sure. Well... There was a library in town before the Cook Memorial Public Library. It was run by a group called the Alpha Club, which is the precursor to today's Libreville Women's Club. Um, They started a subscription library for their members in 1909. And then 1910, they were able to get a shelf in the Decker and Bond drugstore, which is on uh, Milwaukee Avenue, uh, where the Edie or Eddie clothing store is today, right next to Studio West. Um, And then they were able to open that up to the public. In 1914, they were able to move their collection into the brand new Village Hall, uh, which stood about where the the Village Hall is today, uh, but it was a different building. So there was a, a, a library serving the community, but didn't really have a nice, it didn't have a standalone building of its own. It was in a room in the Village Hall. Um, When Emily Barrows Cook, the widow of Anselby Cook, passed away in 1919, she gave the house, uh, which is now the Anselby Cook home, and the park to the village uh, to become a library and a park. Uh, I guess it wasn't a park until it was given to the village. It was just their property. Their their property, yeah. Then it became a park. So it took about a year to get that building ready. Um, The Alpha Club's collection became the basis of that new library. 
Um, and then uh, according to the library board minutes, it opened up on October 22nd, 1921 to the public. So that's really what we're counting as the beginning of Cook Library, that 1921 year. Did the right. library before that even have a name or was it just sort of called library? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't a public library that we think of. It was, you know, a club that offered kinda. a library, a subscription library. You yeah. pay, I think it was a dollar to have a card, but it wasn't a publicly funded library as we think today as we, as we know it today correct so so then uh can you describe a little bit you know more just what this what the what the library inside the cook home would have looked like you know what what kind of thing are we talking about here sure well basically think of your own home with books from the floor to the ceiling uh you know it, it was a home right um so when it opened um, only the first floor of the cook home was used as the library uh, part of the compensation of the librarian was that the second floor was used as uh, their apartment. Uh, so the librarian lived upstairs and the mm. second floor was a librarian's apartment until the early 1950s uh, when the librarian at the time, Lance Mitchell, passed away. Uh, and then the library started looking at that for extra space. And I think we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. But yeah, I mean, basically, if anyone's familiar with the Cook Home today, it looked pretty similar, minus the wallpaper and the flowery carpets that we have in there today. Uh, but there were just shelves built into the walls, uh, and it held uh, books and books and books. So it was a popular uh, place to go. It Most like. definitely. Yeah. And then so, you know, with that popularity, I'm guessing like the the, the usage and the collection grew pretty rapidly. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so I did the research for the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So that's kind of the information and the tidbits I'm most familiar with that All I right, well, can give let's, you today. Let's jump right into there. Yeah. Then, so. uh, well, the reason I was leading into that is because uh, we know that by the end of the 1930s, the library had a collection of 15,000 books, which was five times the amount that it oh, had yeah. when it opened. Um, and you can just imagine it being crammed into, I mean, the first floor of the cook home has a foyer, a front parlor, a middle parlor, a dining room, and a kitchen. So that's what, four rooms in a foyer. <laughs> With 15,000 books. I mean, you know, at some point they were probably putting them in the basement. I know later they were storing them in the attic, but that's a lot of books to imagine and not a really large space. Well, yeah, you still have to get people in there to look, right. at, to look at the books. <laughs> yeah. And they did have, you know, tables and chairs for, you know, in the okay. reference room, they did have armchairs for reading and they did have the dining room was the children's room. Um, so they were encompass encompassing all sorts of population and usage of the library within a small space. It's kind of cool to think that even even back then that far, they still had sort of dedicated children's spaces and adult spaces, yeah. it seems yes. like. And actually for the children's room, they provided there was an entrance into the dining room and that was the children's entrance so that the children did not have to disturb others using the library. So what kind of books would have been sort of the more popular books at the time? Like what 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 would it have felt like to kind of walk into this space if you were, you know, a resident of Libertyville back in the 30s and 40s? Right. Well, I mean, the popular books of the day would have all been there just as they are today. You know, it was a somewhat not really a research collection, I would say, but but a popular usage collection. Um, and every week or every other week in the women's page of the newspaper, they would print the new books or recommended books. Um, and that was to encourage people to get on reserve lists, just like we have reserve lists today. So the library uh, so, would have put those in the newspaper, you're saying? Yes. Okay, right. cool. There was a column, a Cook Library News column uh, that ran regularly in the newspaper. And there was actually a quote in an article when they were encouraging people, they went for a referendum in the late 1930s to get additional funds. And the quote there said, that they really needed the funds because they needed more books. And part of it was, it is difficult to get the new books without reservations a month or two in advance. Five copies of Gone with the Wind fail to fill the demand. There are almost 50 reservations at present. So long reserve lists then, just as there's long reserve lists now, yeah, but it, there was only five copies, whereas we get you know so many more copies. Some things never changed. Death no. taxes and long reservation yeah, lists at the exactly. library. So exactly. I hope I hope they all eventually got their copies of Gone with the Wind. They just had to wait. That's, <laughs> they had to wait. That's, that's how it works. Um, now, in, in we know in the 40s there actually was a uh, a rental collection. So if you think about our Hot Picks collection today, mm. we don't charge people to get it, but if you really wanted a popular title, there was a possibility that you could pay um, a couple of cop a couple of cents uh, per day to check out or rent the popular copies ahead of waiting on the reserve list as well. But the, this period, uh, the 30s and 40s specifically, there were a lot of books that came out that we still have in the library today. So, for example, the Scott Standard Postage Stamp Catalog. 
uh, was first introduced at the library in the 1940s. We still have that in our collection today. And that, that's a catalog to kind of see how much stamps are worth. Is that right? Uh, yes. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Different kinds of stamps. So I should say we don't have the 1940s copy. We have the, the, the latest one. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> we have the most recent copy. Uh, in 1944, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith came out. It mm-hmm. was very popular. Classic. Yeah. Classic. Um, and on the children's side, um, the introduction of Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel, which mm-hmm. I know I read to my kids. Absolutely. Uh, that's been around yeah. forever. Great book. Timeless. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, besides the collection, the, the 40s saw kind of the precursor to what we would call our summer reading program today. But in my mind, it was a lot more intense or could have been more intense for the kids. So Rigorous, yeah. It, rig- rigorous is a good word for it. <laughs> um, so in 1943, we found evidence of the first summer reading. They called it a project, not a club. Mm-hmm. And it was the United Nations Fun Club, which sounds really fun. Um, so the, the kids were required to read three books about a United Nations member country. And I remember this was in the middle of World War II. So very topical. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And in the 1940s, you had to give a book report um, or an or review uh, oh, in order to, prove to it. you had to prove it to the yeah, librarian. To the librarian. Which <laughs> was probably scary. Um, <laughs> um now, if you did that, you received a uh, a small flag from the chosen country. So if you decided to th- read three books on Russia, three books on whatever country, you would get that country's flag. Um, and an added bonus was the newspaper printed the name of every participating child. Uh, so each week there was, you know, this child signed up and this person completed it. And, you know, it must not have been that bad because some children received multiple flags over mm. the summer. Um, and some of them set a goal to read for all the flags, the United Nations countries. And at that point, there was 30 countries. So that would have been 90 books to read in the entire summer. That's a lot of um, oral reports to get. It is. Now, I didn't find whether anybody actually accomplished that or not. But, yeah. you know, that's a good goal for the summer. It's that's a lot of reading. Well, and I remember even when I was a kid, like getting your name in the newspaper, that was a big deal. Big. That was very cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, today someone takes a picture and puts it up on Facebook today. And yeah, you know, that's the news, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> getting exactly. your name in the newspaper when we were kids even was a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the summer reading, you know, really became themed, I would say, in the 50s. Um, and they, again, reflected the time. So they had hobbies and fun, fishing for knowledge. Time to read books are bridges to knowledge and space explorers, of course, mm. in the 1950s. That makes so. a lot of the space race really oh, heating yeah. up. Yeah. Well, speaking of space, different kind of space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, eventually things did grow. Was there other ways that the Cook home was able to expand or grow before we, you know, before they actually built a full, full fledged library building? Yeah, definitely. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the librarian Blanche Mitchell, who had been a librarian since the 1920s, uh, passed away uh, in uh, 1951. Um, her husband actually was living with her as well up in the second floor, and he was allowed to stay up there for a little bit longer. Um, but the library board began to eye that space for expansion mm. into uh, for the library. So the first step after Mr. Mitchell moved out, they moved uh, office equipment upstairs to the second floor and used the rooms for book processing. Uh, so, well, the downstairs was still the public area. Now they had office space upstairs. So it took a couple of years, uh, but in 1954, the library completed both first floor and second floor renovations. Um, on the first floor in the Northwest room, which today is the kitchen of the cook home, uh, it became the teenage room, which I was amazed to find out. I mean, it makes Even sense. Even back then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it have a teen makes space. Sense. With the rise of you know youth culture in the 1950s, true, yeah. But we just added a teen area here to the Cook Library uh, within the last 10 years. Yeah, um, we thought that was new to us, right? I and feel not like. really. It wasn't. But not really. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's really um, no. interesting. What I don't know is how long that team room lasted, and it's not clear that there was one when the new library building was built, but. You know, there was an effort in the 50s to provide space for the teenagers to come in and and study. Upstairs, they did a little more uh, structural work. So uh, they opened up a part of the wall between the the two front bedrooms today so that there was a suite for reading and relaxing uh, so that people could actually go upstairs and, you know, sit in armchairs and read. And they also had uh, local artists have displays in those rooms as well that rotated um, in and out. 
I think this is really fascinating because I feel like we think of it as a, a new thing for libraries to become more like community spaces. Right. You know, like we're, we, we feel like this is the direction libraries are going. And here you see that, like, no, all along, at least at Cook, mm -hmm. there was this idea of, no, we want the library to be a place people can actually hang out in, read in, you know, even if they right. didn't really have the a lot of space for it, they still made the effort to do it, you know. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, there was always the opportunity for the public to come in and sit, read books, read newspapers. I mean, it's a little different than today where people come in with their computers and just, you know, and work from the library. Yeah, right, right. Um, but it was still a welcoming space to to come and use the material. Stay a while. Yeah. Right. The other thing that uh, came in the 1950s with the upstairs as well is that front room. Um, and this was the time when the Liberville Mondelein Historical Society was coming into being. And uh, the front room on the upstairs became the Liberville Historical Room and had displays of historical items, which actually today in, this, in the Cook Home, we still call it the museum room. That room is still dedicated to uh, Liberville History Museum. It's the only room in the Anselby Cook home that is just Liberville history uh, and not Victorian furnishings. Hmm. You know, besides space in the library, the library is looking for ways to reach out to people just as we do today as well. And the 50s saw the introduction of the bookmobile. Yeah, you know, I, so I saw this in your notes, and that's fascinating to me because I had no idea that the bookmobile went back that far, you know, mm -hmm. that, that it really is so central to... Cook's library services, that it goes back that far. It did. Well, and at this point, if you remember from previous uh, podcasts or from our blog post, Libertyville Library was a Libertyville Township Library. So it served the entire township. Um, and the township runs about up to Casey Road, 120, up almost that far north. Um, it runs all the way west to Route 45, uh, and then over to about Route 43. Those are approximate. I don't yeah, have a right, map right. in front of me. Um, <laughs> but if you think about that, I mean, that could put people several miles, which maybe today doesn't seem like such a long distance, but several miles from their central library. Yeah. So there was way, looking for ways to get out to the people that lived in the further parts of the township. So the bookmobile debuted March 1st, 1958, and they had a ribbon cutting. Um, and we have seen in the newspaper that in 1959, some of the stops included uh, the Hawthorne School, Diamond Lake, Oak Grove School, uh, North Libertyville Estates, Roundout School, Bush School, which was north of Libertyville, uh, several stops in Mundelein, which again, part of Mundelein is in Libertyville Township. So for example, the Fairhaven Shopping Center, which is on Holly Street, uh, and several of the um, different subdivisions in Mundelein were also stops for the bookmobile. Now, I, I'm curious. So if is there a picture of the bookmobile anywhere on these blog posts that you've been that you've been writing? Yes, there is. So in the 1950s blog post, there is a picture of um, the bookmobile in 1958. It's a little smaller. It looks kind of like a bakery truck. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute. Very cool. A little longer, maybe. Little yeah. Retro. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. So, I mean, in addition to uh, new ways of getting things out to the public, uh, the library was also getting new technologies in the 1950s. Now, we might not think of them as technology today, but that was new to the library then. So, for example, in 1959, the library got its first microfilm. The newspaper uh, publisher of the Independent Register and the Waukegan News Sun donated microfilm copies of those newspapers, uh, which still are the basis of our microfilm collection today. I mean, that would have been pretty cutting edge, I feel like, at the time to be able to store so much on these little oh, right. reels, you know. Well, that provided access to the newspaper starting in 1894, right? Um, yeah, up through the 1950s. So that's a significant amount of material, especially if you think of the space issues that were going on at Makes the time. Sense. Yeah, to be able to have all of that on microfilm is pretty pretty great. So one of the other new technologies that the library got in the 1950s was a new Gaylord charging machine, which kind of automated the checkout procedure. So this allowed people to have a library card with a metal plate which was then put into the charging machine and it stamped the patron's card number and the due date onto the book card. So much more efficient record keeping than just handwriting everything down. Wow. The circulation had just skyrocketed. Um, so in 1949, they circulated 33,870 items. Um, by 1959, the circulation that year was 111,828 Wow. So yeah, I mean, the population of Liberty was just spiking. Again, this is post-World War II. There's a lot of building going on. There's a baby boom going on. Um, and so the library's usage is 
just amazingly growing during this time period. Now, was it still, even in this time, are we still talking about just one librarian kind of running the whole show or did they finally get some help or? <laughs> no, you know, I don't know exactly how many at this point, um, but as early as a couple of years after the library opened, they hired an assistant librarian. Um, and then in 1926, I hired a children's librarian. Oh, okay. Um, so there was, you know, this isn't one person doing all the work. There are assistants, yeah. there's, you know, uh, shelvers, there's teenage helpers, you know, so they're, they're not doing it all on their own. Well, that's good. Yes. <laughs> That'd be a lot of work. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that, you know, brings us right about up to 1960. I mean, that's a lot that happened in just those first 40 years. Oh, yeah. I mean, the first 40 years to me, and even in maybe the first 50, when we get into the 60s, are, are the most interesting parts of the library's history in my mind, just because there's so much changing and so much growing. The community organization behind it, um, the support of the staff to keep it going, the support of the board to keep it going. Um, I mean, there's a lot more detail in the blog posts about what was happening with the building and referendums and all of that. But, you know, for the podcast, it's just a little more interesting to talk about, you know, the collection and services. Yes, we're doing broad strokes here. This is definitely sort of a teaser to go check out those blog posts. And is it true? I mean, so, so you and Sonia, you really unearthed a lot of this stuff during this year for the centennial, like a lot of the stuff was stuff we didn't quite know for sure. It seems like, or. Yeah. I mean, we've done a little bit of library, mm-hmm. library history in the past. I mean, the beginnings of the library and so cook Emily Barrows cook, that kind of thing is, you know, kind of standard information. Um, but even in our clippings file, we don't have very much in the clippings file for sort of the mid part of the library's history. So we have been spending the last uh, year going through what clippings we do have, going page by page to the library board minutes, Mm -hmm. and then going back to to newspaper microfilm, which is an index based on dates of events we found in the minutes. So yeah, it's, it's taken us, of course, at this point, we had hoped to be finished with the entire hundred years and we're only halfway through. Uh, It's it's taking a longer time, but it's been really interesting to do the research. That's great. And so, and for listeners who might not know clippings file, you're talking about newspaper clippings is what we're talking about. Right. Right. So in the library, in the lower level, we have a local history uh, file, which has all sorts of topics in it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing that work. I mean, it's, you know, really cool to kind of, you know, get a picture, I guess, of what the early Cook Library days were like. Yeah, I have a pre- I really enjoy doing it. I think Sonia has as well. Um, and we're going to uh, push through and plug on and get the rest of them done. But it, it's just going to take us a little while. We want to do a good job. So we're going to take sure. a while. You're going to be thorough. So we will exactly. have us, uh, well, eventually, it might be next year or whatever, yeah. we'll have a second part to this where we kind of get up to the present day. Before we go, though, do you want to give out a little bit of uh, details or promotion on the event that's going to be happening uh, next week? Sure. So um, Sonia and I are doing a presentation on the history of the Cook Memorial Library. Uh, It is next Monday, November 8th at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. You can register it for it uh, through the library's events page or by calling either library and have someone register for you. We did do a version of this back in April. This is expanded as we've done more research over the year. So if you came in April, we invite you to come back and learn even a little bit more than you would have heard then. That'll be great. So uh, definitely register for that. I actually watched the uh, April one, and even that one was really fascinating when you see the pictures and all that kind of stuff. Uh, So it's definitely a much more multimedia experience than kind of what you get through the podcast here. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for being on the podcast again. I I always have a great time talking about the local history stuff and, uh, you know, the centennial is no exception. Well, thanks, Nate. And I'll be back. All right. So that's going to just about do it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed digging into uh, the library's history a little bit with us today. If you would like to attend Monday's event, you can register from our website. The website is cooklib.org. And while you're over on our website, you will see links to our blog, Shelf Life, which is where all the blog posts that we mentioned today are published. That blog's address is shelflife.cooklib.org. And before we go, just a few things. If you ever have any comments or questions, you can reach out to us anytime. You can send us an email to webmaster at cooklib.org or catch us on Twitter at Cook Library. And if you want to support the podcast, just make sure that you share it with those around you and let them know that they can catch this episode along with any of our episodes of the Cook Memorial Public Library podcasts in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever they like to get their podcasts. We will be back soon, but until then, keep reading, keep watching, and keep listening. Keep listening.